thanks for coming out, everyone, on this lovely evening. My name is Sadie Urban. I'm the events coordinator here at the Reserves. Um, this talk tonight is part of a, a year-long lecture series called Dressless Dialogue, and it's sponsored in part by the Cape Cod Forestation Fund, also known as Newsom Grant, and also the Friends of the KBR Help All with the refreshments out there. Um, tonight we have Mark Shepard here to talk to us about restoration agriculture. And um, I'll let Mark jump in. I am going to pass around a sign-up sheet. Um, we do need to keep attendance records for our grant purposes, so please sign in. And I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you for being here. Um, you guys, most of you guys who are here, uh, were, when I asked the question, do you guys want the introduction workshop? You want more nuts and bolts stuff? So I am absolutely, totally on the fly right now. This is not the presentation I'm going to give tonight. That's okay. And this is about three and a half, four hours long, and I'm going to put it in 45 minutes. That's an aerial photograph of our farm right now. It does not look like corn and beans and hay, does it? Uh, it's, it's somewhat radically different. How many of you guys, well, obviously you have, I'll just say, how many of you guys haven't heard about what we're up to out of the farm? Um, I'll go into a lot of different nuts and bolts details of how we transitioned over a 20 year period. Uh, but we have to go a little bit further back than that. Come on, move slide. Oh, there we go. All right. I uh, grew up in an industrial wasteland on the East Coast in Massachusetts, uh, North Central Massachusetts, and that was the river in my backyard. And the big game when we were little kids is uh, what color is the river today? We had blue, green, orange. Uh, most commonly it was like like uh, green, like pea soup, and I hated pea soup as a kid, maybe because it looked like the river. This is all the paper mills and the leather factories just dumping their chemicals into the, uh, into the river. And of course, they can't clean up the river because if they put in a wastewater treatment plant, there'll be this big, huge sucking sound, and all the jobs will go down to Mexico, and the world will come to an end. We can't afford it. The price of the shoes will go you know, sky high. Well, they put in a wastewater treatment plant, but it took someone actually uh, committing acts of vandalism and blocking up the pipes that went out into the river, flooding the factories, shutting the factories down in a nearby shopping mall until they all of a sudden said, you know what, the people are PO'd and we better put in a wastewater treatment plant. Within years, the river cleaned up. And so now this is the natural river in north central Massachusetts. It's the largest green belt riverway in the industrialized east, simply because it was so polluted that nobody built near it. Now there's all these trees alongside it. People canoeing it. A friend of mine fell in once and uh, uh, got a rash, so <laughs> I don't canoe in it. I saw a fish in there uh, just a couple of years ago. It had this big cancerous thing sticking out of its gills, but it was there was a fish in the river. <laughs> when I got out of college, I was about fifty thousand dollars in debt and had no jobs, no prospects of jobs, and I'd always dreamed of living in the woods. And I heard that the Homestead Act in Alaska was going to close forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So I took my tax return and I hitchhiked out to Alaska and Homestead is a piece of property. This is my view from my bedroom window right there. You know, if you were to walk in a straight line, it's 300 miles to the Pacific Ocean, no roads, no houses, no people, and uh, like the fourth largest ice field on the planet, the Bagley Ice Field. It's a beautiful place, uh, but it is the place of storybook legends. Yeah, it gets down to like 30, 40 below here. Twice in the past 20 years, it's been 50 below here. I have a picture of a bang of a fire, it's 52 below zero. Uh, it starts in like November, it goes till like April of that cold. They, they, uh, there's a saying, the bottom fell out. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> so we moved from, from Alaska down here. Uh, we landed in southwest Wisconsin the 10th of February on a, on a played out corn and beans farm with no house, no well, no you know, nothing there. It was just like, and from, <laughs> if you look at this, and now you look at southwest Wisconsin, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so flat. This is disgusting. <laughs> uh, but we're used to living out here when we're like 300 miles from town, three miles off the nearest road, 3,500 feet up the side of the mountain. Walking 10 minutes to the road is nothing. It's totally nothing. And 30 below zero? Ha! Huh, we laugh at it. Um, <laughs> So what we did, we, we moved here with the intention of taking a piece of degraded land and imitating the natural ecosystem and replanting the natural ecosystem, but farming all of the different uh, species within that ecosystem along the way. And that's what we've done. And some of the techniques that we use uh, fall under the rubric of agroforestry. And that is the intentional combination of trees and livestock, crops, and forest-grown products to achieve economic conservation and ecological goals. 
Uh, when I was 20 some odd, when I first moved here, the, the ecological conservation goals were primary. Those were my main <coughs> motivators. But then we showed up with like a one year old and my wife and no house and we're living in a, in a camper behind our, our van. It's like all of a sudden this became very, very important. <laughs> we had no jobs, no prospects of jobs. And at the time, we joined Organic Valley. Uh, I was grower number 24. The whole entire company could sit around two picnic tables. It's like, wow, that's a different story, isn't it? Those would be big picnic tables. <laughs> so we used the agroforestry techniques to establish uh, long-term crops, woody crops, that would be our long-term uh, economic stability. And we used the alleys in between as our cash flow to uh, pay the bills along the way. To find out more about agroforestry, Here's some resources for you. I've got some handouts on the back table. The handouts on the back table are very rudimentary, beginning uh, level stuff. These guys right here, University of Missouri, Center for Agroforestry, they're probably the, the mothership of all the research on, on these types of systems in the, uh, in the US. Uh, a lot of my work is um, influenced by Bill Mollison, permaculture. He coined the word permaculture. It was a contraction between permanent and agriculture. And if you think about agriculture today, most of our staple food crops, our corn, our beans, our rice, our wheat, our peas, our lentils, they're all annual plants. You plant them, they grow for a few months, and then they die. And then you have to plant them again, plant them again, plant them again. It's not a permanent agriculture. So permaculture relies heavily on perennials, and not necessarily on perennial wheat and rice that hasn't been invented yet, but the perennials that actually exist right now. There's plenty of food all around us if we design our agricultural systems accordingly. <clears throat> so I wrote this book, Restoration Agriculture, Real World Permaculture for Farmers. Well, why did I have to write a book if this guy Bill Mollison already did? It's permaculture, the designer's manual. Um, one of the reasons why, uh, we got a design course coming up. One of the reasons why I had to uh, write this book is I became frustrated with where the permaculture movement had, had uh, transitioned or, or morphed into in the US, if you do a, a search for it today, you'll see a lot of things like how to make a 16 brick rocket stove, or how to make a mud pizza oven, um, how to put a rain barrel under your gutter. Those are all great things, but they're not really agriculture. They're really not really solving any problems. Um, if, you, if you take, for example, a 10 by 10 square impermeable surface, uh, in a one inch rain, it generates 62 gallons of water. Putting a rain barrel under your 40 by 40 house is a design failure. It's a hallucination. It's not based on reality. Because when 1,400 gallons come roaring off the roof, it goes pouring down the gutter, spills all over the place, hits that little rain barrel, overflows, goes down to your basement, gets the rub all wet, black mold sets in, three kids get like asthma in their lungs, and because Obamacare doesn't work, they have to go down to Mexico, and all of that kind of stuff. Because rain barrels are a design hallucination. They're not based on reality. It's a good idea to catch your water off your roof. Well, how big is the roof? How much water falls in your roof? How much water do you need to store? That would be a real design. And then agriculture. How about real food instead of like three cabbages in your front yard? Oh, yeah, that old landscape. How long is three cabbages going to last you? How many guys ate today? Okay, we ate. We ate from machines. Machines planted zillions of acres of crops for us. Machines cultivated or did chemical weed control. They harvested it, they, they processed it, they transported it from the next place to the next place. They probably even cooked our food for us. We eat from large scale industrial farms. Get over it. We're not going to go back to being peasants living in a quarter acre yard. One of the things of permaculture is they say, oh, with permaculture, we grow all of our own food in our front yard. No one has ever shown me anybody anywhere around the world that grows all their own food in their front yard. Show me somebody anywhere, then I'll believe you. We get our food from farms, and we need farms. We need to have large-scale quantities of products grown uh, in ecological systems. We're doing a design for the summer, it's already full, can't come. So, we have various different steps. If we're going to transition our farm from the way it is now, let's pretend you've got a bare black dirt cornfield, Actually, probably not bare black dirt. It's probably gray or yellow or red because all black dirt's now down in the Mississippi uh, Delta. The piece of planet where we live right here has been photosynthetically productive for a zillion years with no fossil fuels, commercial fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and utility. Period. It really has. This place has been incredibly productive forever. How do we design a farm to operate that way? 
So what we have to do, if we're going to operate that way, we have to uh, identify and imitate our biome and its natural plant communities. These plant, natural plant communities, this is what has been here for as far as forever is, uh, as far as we're concerned. 6,000 years, 6 million years, who cares what the number is, this is what's been here. We live smack dab right here in the uh, interface between the oak savanna and the northern hardwoods biome. A little bit of prairie pushing in this way, this big sloshing back and forth between forest and prairie. And what's interesting, if you look at these little black dots here, these are holes in the forest canopy. These black dots here are islands out in the sea of grass. And this is that sloshing back and forth. The same species exist here, 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 all the way, all the way across the country, from all the way up here in central Canada down to central, uh, central Mexico. And they start with an overstory of the Fagaces, Oak Chestnut or Beach. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to make a replacement ecology based on the actual ecology. We're not going to do a genuine restoration that we hold and preserve forever. We're going to set up a farm based on natural systems. So our overstory, pick one of these three. Which one do you think you would have the best opportunity for a commercial crop? Currently, right now, there aren't large markets for either oak or beech. There are huge markets for chestnut. This country imports 99% of its chestnuts mostly from, uh, from China. Apples were an understory. Before Europeans showed up, they were mostly crab apples, little, you know, thumb size, fingernail size. Well, what would we substitute for apples in the apple component of our, of our system? How about apples? Wow, this is brilliant. <laughs> you guys are on it. You must have had, like, uh, <laughs> um, perennial weeds for breakfast. <laughs> hazelnut was a dominant brush. If you guys want to go and see the heartland of, of hazelnuts in the U.S., go to Route 27 north of Viroqua and about halfway to Black River Falls, all the way up past uh, Eau Claire on Route 27, the underbrush is 90% hazelnut. Uh, it was said that when Europeans got here to this part of Wisconsin, there were two and a half million acres of hazel brush in, in this part of the country. So hazelnut. What should we substitute for hazelnuts? Um, uh, let's try hazelnuts. Right, do we have to introduce any new food to people? We're already eating this stuff. Already, this stuff is getting shipped around the world in huge container loads. The prunus is plums, cherries, peaches, almonds, apricots. Then we have, whoop, where did you go? Raspberries on the outside of this thing growing out into the grassland. Grapes climbing all over it. Currants and gooseberries in the shade. And then we had fungi decomposing all this organic matter. Forage with the green grass people all around, all around, and livestock, animals. The savanna biome is the biome on planet Earth that supports more mammal uh, biomass than any other biome on the planet. If you just think about the, uh, the um, Serengeti, the savannas of the Serengeti, all the animals out there. The animals are the batteries. They're the solar batteries. Whenever anything is green and growing, they eat it all up and they store it in their muscles and bones and fat. So you think we can set up a farm based on, oh, perhaps chestnut, apples, hazelnut, plums, cherries, peach, almonds, apricots, raspberries, grapes, currants, fungi, forage, livestock? Show me where's the plowing. Where is, where is the fertilizer? There's our fertilizer. A lot of the pest control comes from these guys as well. A lot of the disease control comes from these guys. And what if we're selecting genetic material that actually is adapted to our pest and disease regime? Instead of having to spray to control a pest or disease, why not have genetic variations? These plants that actually are designed to live here. So step one, we're going to identify our biome. Step two, we're now going to design our farm so as to manage the water resource. Um, it, it may be considered to be a heresy, but there is no such thing as a soil deficiency in anything. Got that? There's no such thing as a soil deficiency. Plants will grow anywhere in any kind of soil, anywhere on the planet, period. They just do. They won't grow without water, as far as we know. Uh, so if you're trying to grow a plant that won't grow well, you send your soil test into the university and say, oh, there's a deficiency in XYZ PDQ. Well, yeah, you can go out, you can buy a product and add the product and now your plant will grow, or you can grow a different plant. That plant doesn't belong there. If your fields are too wet in the spring to get that crop in the ground, corn, for example, all this tile drain stuff, not so much here, but elsewhere, I look at all the bottomland fields, you know, how many years we're all from the Kikapoo. We've seen tractors like this in the bottomland fields <laughs> stuck in the mud. Corn is not the crop to grow there. It's the wrong crop. So other than that, we're characterized by drought. 
Uh, even like last summer, we had like, I mean, it was like wet forever, right? June 23rd, I think, when the rain finally stopped. So everything's like lakes everywhere. And then we never had rain again, at least we didn't, until October, November. So even though it was one of the wettest spring on record, we still had a drought. So we need to manage our water resource, uh, ca uh, catch that water, spread it out, slow it down, and soak it into the ground. <clears throat> so this uh, system right here, this farm is designed based on what's called the key line design. It's uh, out of Australia, this guy P.A. Yeomans, uh, modified USDA um, uh, contour farming. And the goal, this is a valley system, this is the only valley that's entirely on our farm. Instead of having this water start here and go 600 feet, and it's off the farm and it drops 100 feet, we spread it out to the ridges, we spread it out to the ridges. So the original water pattern went this way, with a little bit of a change, now it goes down the ridge, around the ridge, and is stored in these ponds. This water here is totally useless, it's now this big huge wall of water going down the Kickapoo, flooding out Viola. None of this water left the farm. It stays on the farm. It, it's my water. If that's a raindrop that falls on my farm, then it's my water. I reserve the right to use it for productivity on, on my farm. <clears throat> uh, one of the tools that we use is a subsoiler. Uh, the, yeoman's, <laughs> the yeoman's equipment is like, you've got to buy the slipper in a yeoman's plow. And it's like a $10,000 version of a $500 chunk of steel. You're just dragging a hook in the ground to cut a slot. <clears throat> When you're using that uh, subsoiler, not the Australians, Yeoman said to use a chisel plow. That's what he meant. Uh, he did not have this in his language. This is an American chisel plow. Don't use the chisel plow. That's not, that's not what's used for this technique. All you want to do is cut slots in the ground so when it rains, the water goes right into the, into the slots in the ground. First of all, we shape the land so that the water goes up high in the valleys to the ridges, and then we cut all the slots so the water goes in and soaks into the ground. When the water goes in, uh, the roots of the plants now have an easy way to go down this little ripped channel. The roots grow like crazy, then you either raise them off or mold them off, and then the roots die back. Well, what, what are the roots made out of? They're plant roots. They're made out of uh, carbohydrates, mostly lignin and cellulose. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen came from the atmosphere. So taking carbon out of the atmosphere, turning it into plant, pumping it into the ground as roots, then we graze off the plant. Well, now there's no plant to support the roots, so the roots die back. All that carbon now becomes fungus and soil organisms and worms, and now you start creating a deeper, thicker topsoil layer. And every year as you go through, Topsoil layer gets thicker and thicker and thicker. We converted our farm from red clay into grayish topsoil. It's not like black chocolate cake topsoil, but to grayish topsoil. 100 acres of topsoil is like 12 to 18 inches deep. It used to be red clay. So we have these linear puddles. First of all, we have the spreading pattern. So when water lands up high in the landscape, it spreads out to the ridges, goes downhill, and it falls into these slots and soaks in. Uh, every linear foot is uh, seven gallons of water. So there's you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. How many floods could we have prevented if we kept the water on our farm and use it for increased productivity? That's the, uh, <clears throat> this is the former valley. And this is starting to set up what you can see. Uh, one of the agroforestry practices we'll get to called alley cropping. We grow our cash crop in the alleys, and we grow our long-term uh, tree crop on either side of it. And the, uh, so the water, instead of going down the valley this way, now comes out to the ridges along these slots. The, uh, the downfall of this is in uh, the springtime, like these lower edges of the fields are wet. So we have, uh, this is uh, annual rye, or I mean winter rye or winter wheat. So we'll plant it in the fall when the, the soil condition is nice and dry, you can get out there and plant stuff. And so when it's really wet in the spring, we don't have to be out in the fields. And we still get a crop on. Uh, this is a, here's another picture I wanted to show you because you can see the color of our soil here. Well, that's the color of what the soil used to be. See the red in the road? By farming, by farming the soil, we actually turned it from red clay into, you know, grayish topsoil. Usually when farming, you burn up the organic matter in the soil and you create red clay, <coughs> you actually turn it around the other way. So what you see here, you see these little ponds. These are located in these, these uh, valleys here. 
And when the water comes down, tries to go down the valley, it hits these little swales, these little ditches that go up to the ridge. If any falls in here, it goes out to the ridge, it goes out to the ridge, and the pattern repeats itself over the whole entire farm. So you can see I mean, what we're doing here is we're actually, this, this part of the farm actually collects water off of about 250 acres. Because if you're foolish enough to send me your water, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. And so uh, where we're located up on the ridge, there's no surface water, no streams, ponds, whatever, with about a mile and a half. Uh, and you go up on the ridge, you come down from like Viola, you're going along the river valley, and the frogs are just like busting your ears out. Then you go up on the ridge, and it's silent. You hear barn fans. You're and then you get with, within so a quarter of a mile of our place, and all of a sudden, here comes the frogs again. With 34 of these little pocket ponds all over our farm, we have amphibians galore. What do amphibians eat? Bugs. Bugs. So they're my, they're my pest control. <coughs> so step one, we identified our biome. Step two, we manage our water resource. Step three, we're going to establish our agroforestry practices using perennial polycultures. A polyculture is many different things growing in the same place. Perennial means it comes back year after year after year after year. And all you guys got to do is look at the brush on the side of the road because we're surrounded by it all over the place. Every single year they go through that eater and they grind it all up. What does it do? It comes back, right? Uh, how about wild asparagus? You know, see people driving all over the place picking wild asparagus? Like, it's that easy. All you have to do is set up a system that's designed to be abused. It gets buried with snow plows, nuked with salt, uh, it gets hit with herbicide, ground up with chippers, and it still keeps coming back. That's called, uh, that's called sustainable agriculture. It's really sustainable. So we're going to uh, use some of the agroforestry practice. And I, I, I think that the uh, alley cropping and silver pasture are probably the two most useful ones, and I'm going to cover both of those a little bit. Alley cropping is the growing of an annual or perennial crop between rows of trees. Now let's just take a, our, you know, a picture in our mind of a, a cornfield around here. You've got a strip of corn, you've got a strip of hay, you've got a strip of beans. And uh, right in the line between those fields, you could be planting high value woody crops that will be yielding umpteen years down the line. Now if you're you know, a dentist or a lawyer and you have the ability to invest a lot of money in trees and you put them in the ground and call it an orchard and maintain them for 15 years with no income, good for you. Uh, I didn't have that opportunity. I had to grow my crops while simultaneously growing my long-term uh, woody crops. So this is, a, this is a picture here of, I think it's black walnut with soybeans in the middle. The agricultural crop is your short-term annual income and your woody crop is your long-term long -term yields. In the early years, it's going to be very light. Later on, it's going to go shady. So in the early years, you can grow crops that require lots of sun and then at some point in time, it'll get so shady that either you're going to have to start to remove trees, or you're going to have to grow crops that are more adapted to the shade. Um, this was a cherry orchard up in uh, Quebec, uh, one of the larger cherry orchards up there, and they were establishing a new block of cherries, and they said, wow, well, let's try this agroforestry stuff. Let's, let's plant salad greens between rows of our new trees, because we know our new trees aren't going to yield for four or five years, so let's get some, let's get some cash off of that, that, uh, those acres. So they started growing salad greens, it went so well the first year that they put in a packing shed for uh, fresh cut, washed, you know, ready to eat um, salad greens. And then they started going into their other cherry blocks where they had mature cherries that were growing. And they, uh, they're now one of the largest uh, fresh cut salad companies in Quebec. Here they were one of the largest cherry producers in Quebec. And now they're one of the largest fresh cut salad producers in Quebec. You don't lose yields this way, you gain yields. You're putting, uh, putting another yield in where you're not getting one now. And that's the whole trick. You may get, for example, you may get less uh, salad greens, fewer salad greens per acre as you would on a solid acre of salad greens. And you may get fewer cherries per acre as you would on a solid acre of cherries. But you get more total yield because, uh, and I'll use a classic example, um, I've grown acorn squash, sunflowers, green peppers, uh, and chestnuts, all in the same acre. An acre of chestnuts, an acre of peppers, an acre of acorn squash, and an acre of sunflowers. And I got about a half a yield of each. So I got a half a yield of this, half a yield of that, half a yield of this, half a yield of that. That's two total yields. I get more yields by yielding less. Does that make sense? It does. It actually does. And then because my costs are close to zero, I've got zero costs involved. I don't have to get three million bushels per acre with no cost. Everything I pick is gravy. These are raspberries between rows of pecans. 
Uh, pecans are going to take, you know, eons, 15, 20 years before they produce, so why not harvest raspberries in the short term? Uh, some of your spacing considerations between, uh, between rows of trees, uh, your, uh, a good measurement is multiples of two times your equipment. So if you go up to the end of the field, you come back, it's two passes. You go up, you come back. You don't want to go up, down, up, and then you drive back not working. So multiples of two times your equipment width. Uh, within the row, between the trees, uh, since I'm using a lot of seedling material, I want, to, I want to plant closer together and remove the trees that don't perform the way I want. Um, just in case you're wondering, corn beans and alfalfa are all compatible with walnuts. Most people have heard, oh, walnuts will kill everything. They don't kill everything. They kill some things. They don't. Don't try to grow potatoes, peppers, eggplant, tomatoes uh, underneath walnuts. Everything else? Almost the sky's the limit, it's just fine. And notice here, uh, you can also use your herbicides. As long as you use the appropriate herbicide that doesn't kill your trees, you get weed control in your trees while you've got weed control in your crop. That's in both worlds. Uh, things are going to change through time. You can see this guy healing a single pass, six row corn planter. The first year is um, three years down the line, the trees are starting to grow. Nine years, now it's time to, uh, time to send them out. Thinking about, oh, it's work, oh, horrible. Well, it's actually a yield. Because you thin these out, and I have logs that you can inoculate for mushrooms. You grow mushrooms, and you sell them through organic valley. Everybody's happy. Um, match the trees to the site. Don't try to grow saguaro cactus up here. You could probably do it with the proper microsite manipulation, all that kind of stuff. Use what works. Imitate your volume. A light shade, you know, not timber honey. Uh, deep rooted or minimal surface roots are the best because that way you're, you're going to be driving by with equipment all the time. You don't want to pack roots or tear roots and introduce uh, decay organisms. <clears throat> One thing that you do want to do is root pruning. Uh, a lot of people have had trees that are growing next to next to a field, and they say, "Oh yeah, there's always lower lower yields next to where row of trees are." Well, here you can see that you can see it's higher. The corn is taller in the middle. It gets more uh, nutrients, and more moisture in the middle. What you do is you pull that subsoil that we were talking about, cut those slots to soak that water in. Every year you drive alongside the row of your trees from the very first day that you plant those trees and you root prune them. This is actually a chestnut forest. Doesn't look like a forest, does it? But this was umpteen years ago. <clears throat> um, and right in here is a row of chestnut trees. Since the very first year we start putting, uh, dragging that subsoil to cut those roots so the roots don't come out and take nutrients and moisture from my, uh, from my yellow crop. And this is, this is, um, this is asparagus. We get about two acres of asparagus on our farm. So this was, um, 1996. That's what our, uh, one year after, uh, we turned it loose and let it, let it grow in with weeds and all that. And you can see these little lines here. We went through and we shaped that ground first so the water flows from here to here. Instead of going down the valley that way, we spread it out to the river. It's going downhill, but we keep it on the farm as long as we can. You see the different ways the water moves. So it's, this is our big one. We get 60 acres over here where the uh, rain's an inch and a half or more. We get a river coming down the middle of the valley. Well, once it hits here, we intercept it and start spreading it out. And Split that river up and so we did. My water. Now, can you see little trees? See them? See, this is agro forestry. Yeah, you, could, you should see the looks on people's faces when I was giving tours like 15, 17 years ago. You guys were on a tour a long time ago, I mean, it's like, oh yeah, right, where's the agro forestry? <laughs> and then through time, it starts to change. So it was, you know, let's see. Oh, that one. Yeah, that's terrible. Okay, so here, boom. Then the tree starts to grow. It grows in water. Fruit time, it always changes. These are, these are your asparagus beds through here. This is uh, squash growing in between the rows. These are peppers over here. Uh, I just did a survey on wild pollinator habitat. My organic certification people uh, kind of got their undies in a bunch because I don't have dedicated, you know, wild pollinator habitat on like, uh, hello, my farm is a wild pollinator habitat island. And so, what am I supposed to do? Put a rope around a certain section? Oh, this is just for the wild pollinators. They're all over the place. Yeah. Once upon a time, this was, you know, just the low green grass with the asparagus growing up. Now the chestnuts are getting taller. 
You can call it still. Your sight is going to change through time. It's always going to change. Squash between rows of hazelnut, uh, 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 alley cereal rye. Sunflowers were part of the Farmer Renewal Energy Program at Organic Valley. And the internal Organic Valley fleet that shovels product from building to building and, and space to space is all run on uh, straight vegetable oil. And six or eight of us farmers actually got together when the whole conversion process uh, took place and we converted our tractor to run on uh, vegetable oil. So my whole entire farm will run on about uh, three acres worth of sunflower oil. And then the meal left over after the pressing is uh, livestock feeds, protein concentrate. So here's sunflowers and chestnuts. Well, not just chestnuts, but we're also getting uh, raspberries in the sun while the, it's a sunny system. And eventually, as it becomes more and more shady, uh, the currents will start to really kick in. The alley width here was not determined based on two times our equipment but on the, the, the size of a 30-year-old chestnut tree. In 30 years, these chestnuts will just barely start to close the canopy in the middle. So that was 30 years of planting. We got 10 years to go. Once upon a time, this was the alley cropping. We had five rows of zucchini in here. We harvested the zucchini. And then as the trees grew up, I didn't want to cut the branches because, I mean, my goodness, I paid X dollars for these little trees. I don't want to prune them back yet. And so we moved in and we put three rows of zucchini in. And then the trees got a little bit bigger, so then we went down to one row of zucchini, and we had one row of zucchini going down the middle. It wasn't really worth the effort to take care of that because we didn't get enough yield out of that one row. And so I looked around at what the weeds were coming into my chestnuts, and they were elderberries and grapes and raspberries and mulberries. <clears throat> Home run. So well, guess what I did? I planted elderberries, grapes, raspberries, and mulberries right down the middle, and then not walk away, uh, but now manage it as a different system. You can see the elderberries in bloom, chestnuts in bloom. All kinds of wildflowers that are out there. <clears throat> and then it grew in even further. So you have to just understand, you guys have all seen brush on the side of the road, old abandoned fields in various different stages. And just take a picture in your mind and say, oh yeah, that was like a three-year-old field, that's a 10-year-old field, this is a 17-year-old. And then you look at it and you design your system. So now all of this, I go down here with my equipment. Two, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. I can manage the whole system. So it's mechanically planted, mechanically maintained, mechanically harvested. I don't sweep the chestnuts yet. I don't have a uh, mechanical sweeper. We still hand harvest them. And then it starts to close in, and all of a sudden my grass starts to disappear. Uh, this area right now has been opened up again because that grass is key, because grass is the food for the livestock, and the cattle, the sheep, the hogs, chickens, etc. Which leads me to silvo pasture. Silvo pasture is the intentional combining of trees and or shrubs, forage and livestock. Now, grazing your animals in the woods without taking care of either the forest or the forage is not silvo pasture. It's turning your cows in the woods. You're going to destroy the regeneration of your forest. Any forest of are going to get totally, you know, trampled and uh, gobbled up, and your cows are going to go hungry. This isn't where they want to be. They want to be in a savanna with both trees and grass. They want some grass. Give it to them. That's not silver pasture either. So many farmers are like, wow, oh, you can't put trees in your pasture, they're all going to hang out underneath it and trample it all down. Well, the reason why they hang out underneath it is because that's the only shade in the whole darn pasture. We want to plant enough trees out here so the whole thing is evenly shaded. They have shade wherever they grow. Where they grow, where they go. Same thing. We can have play with the tree species, the density of the trees, how many we have, the grass species, and the animal maintenance. I've seen uh, silver pasture systems with all of these. Um, if you guys remember uh, when the first tobacco allotment sale happened a number of years ago, these trees right there uh, were part of that. Uh, one of the universities in Georgia took some of the money and uh, they got matching grants. So if you converted from tobacco to a civil pasture system of pine, you'd get this extra matching grants. And what they found out is uh, as of now, they're making more money per acre than they were when they were growing tobacco for a lot less work. And in part, is they, uh, they harvest a lot down there. Instead of like bark mulch for landscapers, they, they harvest the needles. There's uh, what do they call it? Piney mulch. I don't know exactly what they call it. But pecan, oak, and walnut. <clears throat> Black walnut is probably the, the king of agroforestry systems in the U.S. right now. Most systems uh, have that. 40 to 60% shade is what we're looking for. 40 to 60% shade, the grass grows faster because it doesn't get overheated in the middle of the day. It's uh, more tender. 
there's less wood in it, less lignin than cellulose. It's improved digestibility, protein contents up, and plus the animals are happier. <clears throat> we have no idea what the proper stocking density is. I have a feeling that we will never figure that out. That's something that we're always going to be monkeying with. What is the proper number of animals per acre? We don't know. We'll learn. And with a, with a soil pasture system, you want to rotate your animals more frequently, especially during wet periods, because they'll start pugging the soil and really damage the roots and you'll get decay organisms down on the trees. Another reason is that they'll start to browse your trees, which is okay. We use them to browse the trees. Notice there are no branches down below. That's because they browse all the branches off. I didn't have to prune those trees. They did it for me. Now, mob stalking your animals, all you have to do is confine them to a very small space so that they've got no choice but to eat everything that's in front of their face right now, their shoulder to shoulder. It takes about a week, week and a half, two, and all of a sudden, they snap. And now they're a herd. They're not individual cattle grazing, they're a herd. And you can notice that the fence is, you know, umpteen feet away, it doesn't matter. They are shoulder to shoulder always. And if you watch the cattle graze, they're grazing and grazing, and they see this guy over here grazing fast, like, oh, I better move faster. So they eat more, they eat faster, they eat things that they wouldn't ordinarily eat. And then they trample behind them, they trample down this mulch and they poop and they pee all over it because you keep them confined to a smaller area before moving them on. And the idea is to imitate what happens in like the Serengeti where there's like a zillion animals moving through and they just, they just eat everything. By the time the animals move out of the Serengeti on the migration, it's, it's, it looks wasted. It's like animals are all over the place. This is being done all over the place, Australia, Africa, um, our chickens, we try to do a portable chicken cage thing. Joel Salton says you can get a 20% feed reduction, uh, but he didn't tell you that you get about an 8,000% labor increase. <laughs> and you can't keep the darn chickens in. If they want to get out, they're going to get out. There's nothing we can do to keep the chickens from getting behind the cow. That's just where they want to be, that's where they belong. And if you, once again, go back to the Serengeti and see all these birds all over the place hopping along behind big animals. And what's interesting, when you're, when you're mob stalking it, what motivation do the cattle have to break through the fence and go over here? None whatsoever. When they break through the fence, they're going where you want them to go next anyways. Right? Because that's the best green grass. So they trample this down, they graze it all down, and they're going to break out. If they're going to break up, they're going that way. That's where you want them to go anyways. Then you just move the fence around because you're a little bit late. <laughs> it's your fault, not theirs. <clears throat> um, this is on our farm, silver pasture system. Uh, black walnut mulberries uh, with the cattle. If you're growing black walnut for timber, you want to have uh, removed branches down low, so it'd be a nice, you know, not free log. Uh, and you want to have some grass control underneath, and you want to have some fertilizer. Who's doing our grass control? Who's doing the fertilizer? And who's doing the pruning for us? Super simple. Really, really simple. This is entirely animal maintenance right there. You can establish trees in your pastures, or establish pastures in your trees. Now, with establishing pastures in your trees, I don't mean going into a forest and nuking a forest. If you have forest ephemerals, you know, ramps and lady slippers and that sort of thing, don't go there. But if you have an old overgrown savanna that once upon a time was savanna grassland underneath, you'll notice it because of these big, huge oak trees or, you know, wide, open-grown hickory trees, then it's not a crime to go in and clear out the brush underneath it. I don't have a lot of time to go through this, so I'll just kind of fly. Protect your trees with fence. Um, you can adjust the lower strand of this fence here so they can stick their head underneath and then graze all that. They can stick their head underneath and graze all that. You will lose eight inches of, uh, of field. So you're not losing a lot of productivity, you're gaining. You do want to move them before they start to do damage to your trees. They're going to start to scratch and rub. I like a little bit of abuse. I want them to do some browsing. I want to do some scratching and rubbing, but I don't want to destroy my trees. I thought it was a good idea once upon a time. You can use tree tubes to protect your trees, but don't leave your animals in there too long. I came home once and had a Jersey steer with about a foot and a half of a five foot tree tube sticking out of its mouth. It's called ram, ram, ram. <laughs> and so I stood on the animal and pulled it out, and the sounds that I heard and the snog, the snog is a word, isn't it? That came out of this animal. And I figured that'll learn, you're right. So I didn't learn him, it learned everybody else. I went to the house for dinner, I came back, and now three of them were doing it. <laughs> Don't leave them there too long. You can do this until they're bored, and then, yeah, move on. And then you guys are familiar with cattle. <laughs> this is actually, this is long-term, this is value-added real estate. 
if you have a farm that's bare black dirt, corn stubble, and you have a, a chemical uh, building with the steel bunkers and the concrete walls around it as a toxic waste site, and a 7,000 animal confinement operation, what will sell for more money, that or this? Every time, over and over and over again. Because what you can do is just, you know, put the little curvy driveway through there and make mansion and all that kind of stuff. Someday, you are going to turn over your real estate to somebody else. Let's leave our campsite a better place that is a much higher value than a toxic wasteland, whether you're harvesting pecans as nuts, whether you're harvesting pecans as timber, raising it, or selling it as house lots. This is a far more valuable piece of real estate. Over and over and over again. <clears throat> Just other examples, what it looks like. This is an example that was down in Lancaster. This guy wanted me to help with a uh, civil pasture system. He wanted me to put trees on his pasture. I said, well, what about this over here? Oh, no, that's my woods. He's like, that's not my woods. Well, yes, it is. Let's go for a walk in the woods. Well, you can't get in there. Why not? Perfectly asked multi-floor rows. The honeysuckle is just an amazing tangle. And there's only a few trees. There's really not a lot of trees out there. So what we did, <clears throat> it was actually one of the largest point sources of multi-floor rows in, in uh, Grant County. So we called in at Ernie. You give, there's Ernie's all over the place, and they have these little grinder things. You give them raisins and uh, diesel fuel, and they'll stay busy. Grinds everything up. He even grinds up tires. And we were pretty proud of ourselves when we watched these tires get ground up until I saw all these like, steel belts hanging up in the air and had visions of Jersey cows doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and so these tires were actually, there's a field over here, you can kind of see the light. They were, they were a story of a man who was farming. Uh, and his, his growth and his age as he went along. When he was in his 20s or whatever, he started farming. He had Model T's, and he could throw the tires a long distance. By the time he was 70, 80 years old, he was just dropping them over the fence. So they got closer and closer to the fence, and they got thicker and fatter and wider. I think they still bred the same kind of seed oats, though. And then what we did is we removed the trees that, uh, were, that had no long-term commercial value. We left the ones that were deep-rooted, straight and tall. We, we marked the ones we wanted to keep instead of marking the ones we wanted to remove. Then we planted grass. We filled it in holes with young trees, with uh, tree tubes. So this is like a before and an after. Still has the same amount of timber on it, but the timber is now a higher quality timber. It's going to grow faster, like you've seen your carrots out. You get bigger carrots, fatter carrots, faster. The same thing. These trees are going to grow faster. They'll gain uh, wood better. And the very first crop was pasture walkers. How many of you guys are into like your pasture walks? Tell you what, these rotational grazing people, they're freaks. They'll go, up, <laughs> they'll go up 38 degrees and it's pouring rain and it's so cold that you got an ice cold soda pop and a brat and they'll just walk around all day long. <laughs> First crop. Second crop, turn the, turn the girls loose and they're just happy as can be. They're all in the shade, a lot more grass. So this guy gained 30 acres of, of pasture that he didn't know he had. So what is the value of 30 acres of land if we get $3,000 an acre? 30 acres, that's $90,000. We're just going to clear out a little brush, putting some grass seed in. He just gained $90,000 worth of value. We left behind a lot of these legacy trees for, for, for owls and woodpecker habitat. That's your pest control. We want to improve the productivity of grazing animals, diversity of forage, wildlife, <coughs> timber management, blah, blah, blah. These are numbers. This is funny. You get, you know, uh, stress on cattle decrease efficiency by 20%. Average feed bill is less by $30. 25 pretty soon it's like you do all this math and the numbers make me go crazy. It's like after a while, it's like, gee whiz, you put animals out there and the money just like grows on trees or something. This guy uh, did the research at the uh, University of Missouri, Columbia. $42 an animal greater uh, in a silver pasture system per animal. What I find fascinating, this is USDA data that has been pulled because it's factual, but they, they've determined it's not causal. Uh, as the number of sheep on the landscape have gone down, as herbicide use has increased, uh, weeds have gone up. So with more herbicide use, we have more weed pressure than when my grandpa was farming. Okay, why? Well, this guy, the report showed a correlation between the sheep numbers decline and weeds going up but they couldn't prove that that's what caused it. I don't know what caused it. I wonder if it's uh, breeding herbicide-resistant weeds. But the, the sheep are a phenomenal weed control. There's a, uh, that's Lola, 
pretty good well. We use the sheet here as uh, brush control to get rid of the stuff that we uh, don't necessarily want. Sumac, multi-floater rose, honeysuckle, you put them in the netting, you put them in way too close, and you make them destroy that place. They rip it to shreds. They'll, they'll do pretty good brush control for you. This is uh, managed uh, exclusively by the animals, our overstory of our trees and the cattle underneath. You can see that they will get bored after a while. They start scratching and tearing branches. And that's fine. Uh, then after the cattle, we turn the piggies loose. And there's actually uh, certain blocks that we have that are exclusively for, an for the animals. If there's no human food comes off of that, this is one of them right here. This is a system designed solely for the animals. Um, happy pigs, that's all we need to keep them in. And what's, what's fascinating, why would you want to go anywhere else when there's, when there's chestnuts and mulberries and elderberries, when there's food all over the place? Why break out? They don't. And then when they're all whistled, they're all, we have them uh, uh, voice command, you just give a whistle, they come running no matter where they are. We put rings in their noses so they don't plow up the pasture, because the pasture is what it's all about. <clears throat> That's feeding our animals. So the cattle <clears throat> and pigs and sheep, if you notice here that the grass is already been grazed, so we're getting two grazing about the same area. We don't graze down in ovens, we move them through really quick, we do this abusive trample graze, and then we, we clean up with the pigs and the sheep. And we let the cows, we let the cattle chew on the trees. You know, people, oh, they'll destroy your trees. No, they won't destroy your trees. They'll destroy your trees if you leave them there forever. And these are young chestnut trees that are established. We look at they've been shredded by the animals. But there's weed control. The weeds have been eaten down. There's manure all over the place. They've got fertilizer. They've got weed control out there in the sun. <clears throat> and this is what we're looking for. A nice 50% pack, 50% graze, and manure everywhere. And yet, branches are broken down low, I don't care. Uh, apple orchards sometimes get sick when they come to tour my place because it looked like somebody bombed it. <laughs> but it's all right. What are my costs? I'm not spraying anything in my apple orchard, nothing at all. And then the chickens come through, and they start scratching apart these patties, looking for undigested bits of, of seeds and grains, and also for insect larvae. The turkeys go on through. Turkeys are amazing grasshopper catchers. Totally amazing grasshopper catchers. And then the sheeps, they're weed control. <clears throat> and look at those birds. Are these domestic little tame little henny things? These are wild arse dinosaur chickens. <laughs> <laughs> and people say, well, gee, don't you have a problem with predators? It's like, well, with the smart ones. <laughs> First year, you're going to have pretty amazing losses, you will. And second year, you'll have some losses. Third year, we have like four animals out of a thousand. That was it. Because they are smart. There's still chickens hanging around. And last fall, it's like, wait a minute, there's still some out there? I don't know if I want smart ones to overwinter because they're going to teach everybody else how to escape from me. So I actually had to go hunting. And I hunted chickens. It's like turkey and I hunted chickens with a bow up a tree. Great. And they'll follow you around because we also do feel a little scratch and give them their voice command and they come to follow you. All right, <clears throat> grapes on chestnuts over hazelnut next to the rose. This is an apple orchard. You can't even find the apple tree, can you? Well, neither can the pests. And why would I spray fungicides in my apple orchard when fungicides kill fungus? Anybody seen it yet? There's more money in morels in my apple orchard than there is in apples. There's more money in cut flowers, daffodils, and comfrey. I used to sell comfrey as a medicinal herb on iris roots. Uh, and so we got, in the spring, we've got morels, we've got daffodils, we've got irises, we've got comfrey, we've got uh, cattle, hogs, sheep, chickens, turkey. Oh, yeah, right, apples. Ten different crops in the same place. I can get half a crop of everything. Oh, you won't get yields that way. Don't tell them. Don't tell them that. Pictures of what it looks like. And then this is what, how prior what I was meaning about the uh, uh, disease control, because the, the uh, cattle graze all browse, not graze, browse all the branches down low, and then the pigs they roll in their wallow and they have boar bristle brushes on them and they brush all the coarse bark off. Now there's no coarse flaky bark for calling moths and other other pests to overwinter in. So they're doing my biodynamic tree paste for me if you want to do your biodynamic tree paste. Clean up in the fall. We, well, we pick the low hanging fruit, so we've already harvested here. And if it's got bugs in it, we throw it on the ground. And then who cleans up after we're done picking? We're finished picking, animals go in, clean it all up. These guys are happy as can be to eat bug laden fruit. And when those larvae are in the, in the fruit, it goes into the pork, and I eat it as pork chops. So my, my pest control 
uh, consists of bacon. <laughs> this is my family right here. This is a couple of years ago. This is my younger son Daniel. He's the one I'm going to go to the award ceremony and see him get that scholarship. Oh, hold on. Uh, he's at UW Madison. And this gal right here, if it wasn't for her, I don't know if I would be here today. That's my wife Jennifer. Um, this picture, what you see right here, uh, the green all around us was a cornfield 15 years before this picture was taken. It was actually an abandoned cornfield. It was eroded red clay. And now it's growing 10 crops you know, per acre. Uh, and I think what's more important than 10 crops per acre that's growing, it's growing one of the most amazingly powerful forces in the universe. And you can see it here, that's the power of love. Because we have done this out of an act of love, and it's been hard, arse work every step of the way. But we're going to do it, and we're going to keep doing it. And it will only take 15 years to totally change the entire face of the planet. Because if one little family can do it on 100 acres, and you do it on 100 acres, and everybody does it on their place where they're at, 15 years from now, we're living, living in a lush jungle paradise with... 10 different crops growing in the same place. We never have to plow again. I'm a lazy farmer. I really don't work much at all. I would rather hang out with these people than, than go ride on my tractor for nine hours a day, listen to country music and brush <laughs> 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 oh. We are in a critical juncture in human history right now. Never before has humanity had the power to change things for the worse as we do right now. We can really mess things up in a hurry in spades. What it takes is every one of us turning away from Rome and taking one step into the future, one green step at a time. Now, I'm not into like the pointy houses and like little Buddha circles and stuff like that. <laughs> That's not my thing, but the point is we can walk away from this, create this as our business. We are creating this as our profitable farming enterprise. We're imitating nature's natural systems. We're using natural pest control, disease control. We're getting more total yields per acre, not more total yields per crop. More total yields per acre at a lower cost. We're paying our bills. This is the agriculture of the future. So thank you very much for being here. I'll take questions for six minutes, and that's it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, you just showed your family, and you said your two kids are going to school. Yes. Are they going to are they going to come back and do this, or do you think they're going to go on other things? What's like? fascinating about this? One of the things that we also did is they already own the properties. We've been passing it down through the years, uh, how we set it up and structured it. And it was just two years ago when he turned 18, he was like, "Oh my goodness, Dad, I, I really do own this farm." So, Yes, you do. So what, whether they actually live there and work this or not is kind of irrelevant. Because think of all the trees around here. If you've got timber property, if, if I, I have timber property that's not this particular farm here, I haven't been there in years. You don't have to be there. It, it'll just keep growing and getting better and better. I took a vacation four years ago. Well, and when we came I mean, back, the farm was better. It's kind of reminding you know, if you grew up on a farm around here, it, it was pretty cool, but a lot of work. You're right. And this looks like a lot of work. And you know, I wonder if those... Um, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot less work. really want to do it, or they're going to be gone, and the farm's going to be here. And, uh, it's, it's bunch an, of interesting, an interesting story. This guy right here, I needed a bulldozer. I wanted a bulldozer to do some more of these move, making swales and burns to manage water. Um, I didn't have the, the, the necessity enough to buy it myself, but I had some cash at the time. I said, hey, Eric, start a, a rental company business. <clears throat> I'll loan you the money, you buy a bulldozer, and then you rent the bulldozer to me. And then I'll go do all whatever it is. You get, you know, get business experience, all this kind of stuff. He says, I got a better idea, Dad. I want to buy a plane. It's like, <laughs> don't you hey, whoa. <laughs> hear me out, Dad. Uh, think about all the different places that you fly in the course of the year. And I fly around a lot giving presentations. He says, I know, because I've looked it up on orbits and I've done estimates on all of it. And, and if you were to loan me this much money, I can buy you on a timeshare on a plane, get my pilot's license, and then I'll, I'll fly you around. It's like, <laughs> who can argue with that? <clears throat> so he's, he's about two hours away from his pilot's license right now. Awesome. He's going to Princeton, all bets are off. Who knows what's going to happen. I hope he keeps himself. He's a real sweetheart. Any of you guys know Daniel, he's one of the most kind, gentle, wonderful people I've ever met. I don't know how on earth he grew up to be so well-adjusted with parents like me. <laughs> 
So I don't know what they do. It's their business. I don't know. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. How many people work on this farm? Uh, this year we've got um, four. And well, how we set things up? We set things up as individual enterprises. And uh, right now the produce person, that's their own independent enterprise. And then I'm the uh, pigs and the nuts. And then there's the cider business. And everything is its own independent uh, entity. The most we've ever had was eight. And so what we'll do is we'll custom hire one another back and forth. I need people planting trees. You know, I'll hire these guys. You know, you need somebody to come in and help me the squash. You know, I'll come in and weed the squash. So it's all done. And part of what it is, it's a, it's a training program for young folks who want to get into farming. You can go on internships all over the country and learn how to pull weeds out of radishes, but you never learn how to farm. Because farming is, is playing with your numbers and knowing how to run your books. And so that's part of what we teach them. It's how to run your enterprise. So did I successfully avoid answering your question? <laughs> All right, good. I tried. Other question? I hurry up. I'm going down to kick You guys got to come down. Are you, still, yeah. are you still giving tours of it? <clears throat> yeah. You'll have to go to uh, which website? I don't know whose website. Because, so you got, you yeah, got the person who does the tours is Peter Allen. And he's either Mastodon Valley, Savannah Gardens, uh, or there's a link through the Forest Ag website or New Forest Farms website. Because that's another thing, is everything is a separate enterprise. I've got bosses all over the place. It's not, I'm not the boss, I'm just like a puppeteer. Yeah, and Dana, if you guys try to contact me, you're going to get in touch with Dana, shut that camera off. 